we can do uh, our prayers and praises. something that uh, is bothering somebody or making somebody anxious or sad or 
or making somebody happy, Lord. You know, you know how to work within their lives, and, and your will, Lord, is perfect. And I just ask that you answer any unspoken prayer that there may be. But, Lord, there's a lot that we share with one another and comfort one another. And, um, you know, you tell us to do that, to uh, mourn with those that are mourning and to uh, praise with those that have a lot of joy and praise, Lord. And so I ask for prayers for Kevin, who is uh, taking a turn for the worst, Lord. We continue to pray for him for healing and for miracles and blessings on his life, Lord. And for his family, who has endured a long time without uh, him, Lord. And I also ask for prayers for Dee, uh, who is going to be going in for um, a checkup for her heart, and that, Lord, you just give wisdom to the doctors to know how to deal with her situation, and for health, Lord, for her and Denny, both. Uh, prayers for Jerry and his life when he has just so much going on, Lord, and he just asks for patience, and I know he has a lot of patience, Lord, but he needs even more, and he needs your help to intervene and to um, just have the Holy Spirit give him all of those gifts, Lord, and the fruits that he needs to um, be able to uh, go on from here, Lord, and continue to be uh, the testimony that he is, and help him with his um, schedule. Give him a wisdom and uh, guidance to know um, what to say yes to and what that he may be not be able to say yes to, Lord, to try to um, give his life a little ease, Lord. And I also pray for the man that we, we do not know his name or what his circumstance was, but for whatever that was at the Wawa that we saw him and he was acting uh, erratically and, and not uh, himself maybe, or we don't really know, Lord. But whatever it is, Lord, I just ask that prayers for him and for his family and for the uh, police officers that were dealing uh, with him, Lord, that everything uh, goes okay. They figure out what's wrong with him. And Lord, I just ask that um, somebody along the way um, come along and, and maybe uh, plant a little kindness in his heart, Lord, because he looks like maybe he needed that. Lord, we all are called to be disciples of Christ, and uh, that takes a lot of courage. So I ask, Lord, that you continue to bless us at this church to be the most um, effective disciples of your son, Jesus Christ. Help us to walk like Jesus and to forgive and to love like Jesus, Lord. And Lord, there are so many things that we are praiseworthy for joy and answered prayers, um, for Linda being here, and so many returning here, with Jeanette, and uh, so many visitors that are here, Lord. Oh, what a, what a blessing it is. And uh, we are praising you, Lord, and Dean Denning were able to get a hold of uh, somebody to get their shots, Lord. And uh, for Jim and his uh, surgery, for uh, Denny, who was a testimony that he uh, was um, is able to finish the Bible again for a second time. For our church, Lord, for this beautiful day that we're able to gather together. And Lord, we all know that we are here for one purpose, to celebrate the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. He made a way for us to not have to um, feel death. He has risen, so we may be risen, Lord, and that's what we have to focus on. All glory is to you for your grace and for your forgiveness and for your gift of your son, Jesus. Lord, I just continue to pray for our church and pray that we are, again, a beacon of light, that we can shine that on our neighbors, on our community, and maybe even beyond our community, Lord, to the world. Lord, bless us today. Bless those that are not able to make it here today, Lord, and continue to bless all the churches, Lord, as they are grappling with so many things that are going on, that they continue to grow both physically and spiritually, Lord. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, so we have, I would like to, maybe we'll do our next hymn, and then, we could, then we'll do the Bible reading. So our next hymn is 310, Stand of Reading. Thank you. 
Mark 16, 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spice so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is a place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee, where you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The word of God for the people of God. All right, so, you know, when I start make, writing a sermon, when I start doing this process, usually what I do is I read the um, Bible scripture, obviously, first. And I'll, sometimes we'll take a day or two to kind of contemplate on what that is saying and how it's speaking to me. And, of course, every year we tell the same story, right? We say the Easter story, the resurrection, all that. But every year it speaks to me in a different way. And this year, I was really focused on the word, how they ended it with, they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And that word afraid kind of struck me as a year that we are all having, a fear. All of us are kind of living in this fear. So that, of course, gets me to start believing or thinking of my life and the times when I was in fear of things, you know other than what recently, of course, we've been in fear of. So when I was 18 years old, my mom, uh, my brother, me, my dog, Gizmo, which that's such an 80s name, <laughs> my dog, Gizmo. And I, 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 I treated Gizmo the same way I did Chewy, so you can believe this was a very spoiled little dog. Uh, but we were all in the car. We were getting ready to go to lunch with a friend. Now, I was, like I said, 18. I was on break for with college, so spring break. I was newly engaged, newly engaged. So there were a lot of good things happening in my life. And um, I, we were in this car, sit driving, and I can remember I was in the back seat. My my brother was in the front seat. My mother was obviously driving. I had my dog in the in next to me, and I can remember seeing a car coming straight for us. It was like at a fork in a road type thing, you know? 
And here comes the car, but I didn't have enough time to like say anything. Like a car's coming for I didn't, you know, didn't, it seemed to happen. It kind of seemed to happen in slow motion, really, honestly. But all of a sudden, bang, the car, that was perfect. <laughs> Mercedes. If you guys know about 1980s, they're like tanks. They're like, you know, so that probably saved our lives. But, and the other car was just this tiny little sedan that kind of spun off and went somewhere. But we all came to, and of course my mother, we were all hurt. My mother said, is everybody okay, everybody okay? My, head, my brother's head was bleeding because everything was pushed forward. And my leg went to the back of my brother's seat. And immediately I knew my leg was broken. I don't know how you know these things, but my, I knew my leg was broken. And I said to my mother, my leg's broken. She goes, you don't know that. I said, yeah, I, I do. <laughs> <laughs> and those of you who know my mother can hear her saying that, I think. So um, the ambulance comes, of course. Now, my, I thought my dog was dead, by the way, because he was just a little um, shih tzu. But I spoiled this dog. I had him in a, in a comforter that he was sitting on. This thing enveloped him like a little burrito, that's the only way I can think of, and it little, literally slid off and went to the floor of the thing. He was fine, he didn't know what hit him. I mean, he was like, <laughs> he, he jumped out and he was completely fine. But yeah, so he, he was, we were all somewhat fine, I guess, but we went to the hospital, had x-rays, exams and everything, and they put my leg in a cast, Thank you very much. <laughs> and they said to me, you know, go home, business as normal, business as usual, right? Well, that didn't happen for me because I went home and I went home very depressed, very scared, and I vowed I was never going to drive again. That was it. 18 years old, my whole driving life ahead of me, and I vowed I never was going to drive again. My parents were worried about me. They, they said, oh, listen, you got to go to a therapist. You got to figure out. You got to sort this out, you know? So I go to the therapist, and of course, I was so stubborn that that didn't even help. You know, I was telling the therapist, I'm never driving again, you know, and he didn't even know what to do with me. But, um, you know, so I lived in this fear, and I was very ashamed of it at the same time. Because if somebody asked me to drive somewhere, like to do an errand, I'd be like, oh, no, no I, you know, I'd make an excuse. And Steve drove me around, my mother drove me around, and I lived in a little town. This was in Maryland. And the little town, I could walk to the library, to a French bakery, and a pizzeria. What more do you need in life? That's all I needed. So I walked, I walked everywhere. And then finally, I, I got married to the person I was engaged to, Steve, at the time. I had my first child, and only my closest friends knew about this fear that I had. And I still, honestly, to this day, I really don't like driving that much. I'll say to people, can you drive if we go up to the mall or something like that? And I don't give the backdrop story. They just know I just don't really like to drive. So this story was the first thing I thought of when I read the story in, in the Bible for this particular verse that we were reading. Because notice that the, what, what, how it ended, how I ended it in Mark, was they were afraid. They ran away, said nothing, and were afraid. What an ending to the story, isn't it? Because it's this great story of the resurrection, and I mean, there should be like fireworks and fanfare and these great things. And all it says is, they said nothing and we were afraid. What a wedding. Now, of course, we see 9 through 20. The verse says it doesn't end at 8, but guess what? It did originally end at 8. Almost every 100% scholar believes that verses 9 through 20 of Mark, which we are going to read, were added later. Now, who knows why they were added later? I mean, maybe because they didn't like the ending of it, ending in fear, right? There's so much more to the story. So, when we think about this gospel, we don't think about that downer ending, do we? We think of this. Let's read verses 9 through 20. It says this. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and told who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping. When they heard that Jesus was alive, they, that she had seen him, they did not believe it. Afterward, Jesus appeared in a, in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country. These would turn and report it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. 
He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. He said to them, go into the world and preach to the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptizing will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will be accompanying those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven, and he sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them, confirmed his words by the sign that accompanied it. This is a much better ending, isn't it? I mean, who were afraid in the beginning? Who was afraid? Well, Mary and all of her friends, right? Mary Magdalene was there. Mary, the mother of James and Salome. That's who were afraid. They went to, they had, they had these plans, you know? We all talk about plans. We all have plans in life. They had plans. They had plans to prepare the body after it had died. And let me talk to you about that. When we speak about um, death and burial, it's not the same as what we are we're used to. We don't, they didn't dig a hole six feet and put the body in and that was it, maybe go decorate it every once in a while. No, what happened was you had a year to prepare this body. So you would put the body in the tomb just as it was, lay it on a stone. They would then, after a couple of days, get it prepared by putting oils and spices all over it. One was to take away the smell of the dead body. And the other one was to actually help the body decompose faster. Because in one year, they would then go back and collect all the bones of that person. And then put it like in a little box that was in another place in that tomb. So it was a year of preparation. It took planning, it took people, it took loved ones to do all this. So they go there with these plans to prepare Jesus' body. But they didn't know that it was going to be a different plan, did they? They were afraid. So they just ran away. But now we read chapter 20, and this is now the perfect ending. It actually is the beginning, isn't it? It's not the ending at all. So the people that were closest to Jesus, this is who he's visiting. And he's not going to just one or two people. Many times he's visiting all of these people. And some are believing, and some guess what or not. They don't believe that he has risen from the dead. But Jesus has is alive. And that's the part of the Easter story. That's the main point of the Easter story. All the preparing for the, his body, it wasn't needed anymore. There was something else that took the place. God had it all planned out. And the fear was replaced with the good news of Christ. This is the Easter story. That death no longer had a grip on us because God's grace, through his son Jesus, now not preparing for death, we prepare for what Jesus has in store for us. So now Jesus says this in verse 15. He commands us, go into all the world and preach the gospel out to all creation. So do you see what this means for us at Easter time? The Easter story could have ended at 8, at verse 8. It could have ended with, they had said nothing and they feared. And the women went to have all these plans and preparations, but guess what? They didn't need it. Because he is risen. He is risen indeed. By God's grace, Jesus was standing in front of them. And this is the important part that I want you to remember. And instead of them preparing him, he's preparing them with better plans. Every single one of us here has a story in their life. Maybe you're in the middle of the story. I don't know. But you could end it in fear. Every single one of us. We could end the story right there. I could have ended it mine in fear. Now think about that. If I never had driven again, I probably wouldn't be standing right here because I wouldn't have been able to drive to all the different things that I would have to go to and appointments and, and this and that and all that. Right? My life would have been completely different because of fear. It could have ended there. 
Think about that. I had to make a choice to have faith over fear. And that to me is what this story is about. With God's help, I lived in faith. And that diminished the fear. Any one of us, even if you think for a moment. And fear is from us. That's what I want you to understand. It's about our own limitations. When we say God knows God, God's plans are better than our plans, or God's ways are higher than ours, fear is the limitations that we think we know better than what God knows. It limits us. It creates fear. Fear is from our own minds, our own insecurities. It's not from God. So the Easter story could have ended in fear because that's the way the humans felt at that time. But it didn't because God took over. Easter is because of God's grace. It wipes away fear and replaces it with faith. And it replaces it with action. I always say that. Being a Christian is an action, right? I said that once before. It's an action verb. I think it's a Thanksgiving too. It's an action. It's not just being a Christian. It's acting like a Christian. It's going out into the world as he commands. Jesus is alive. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He's alive and he's standing before the people in the story. He's guiding them. He's comforting them. He does the same thing for us every single day. This is what Jesus says to you. He says this. He says, stop all the plans that you think are necessary. Stop taking control of your life because you think you have control and you know better than anything else. He's saying, stop. Because I have better plans for you. Just like he did for all those women who were planning on helping him through the process, he's helping them now. He turns it around. And he says this, stop being afraid. And follow me. For I am risen, risen indeed. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yes. God is love. There's no fear in love. A perfect love drives out fear. Drives out fear. First John 4, 18. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you. Let's sing our Amen. last hymn, which is a rousing hymn. I want to hear our voices. 302. <laughs>
take away from today. It's something, again, that kind of jumped out at me. Um, if we read the, um, the Mark 18, 1 through 8, there's one portion that says, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. Ahead. And that really struck me as something. We don't have to know the path, right? Because God leads us. He's ahead of us. And he's the one that shows us the way. He's the one. And that means if somebody's guiding, if somebody guide on a, on, you know, a walk and you don't know where you're going, if somebody's guiding you and leading you, there's no fear. You know where you're going. All we have to, all have to do is obey and walk in the way of the Lord. And this is the end of thing, which is in your bulletin. It was Deuteronomy 31.8. And I want you to remember this. When you are in fear and you are in doubt, and anything comes up that you say, uh, you know, I, I can live in fear about this. This is what I want you to remember. It says here, the Lord himself goes before you. That means he leads you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. That means he's by your side forever. Right? He's leading. He's leading you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. This is the verse I want you to remember. Write it on something. Plaster it on your mirror in the morning when you wake up. Put it in your car. Put it anywhere that you can put it. Because you have to remember this. God is leading you. He's before you. That's the Easter story. Easter does not happen because we put flowers or baskets or bunnies. Easter happened because God's plan was to put Jesus before you, alive, leading you, comforting you. That's the Easter story. That's what you take away today. Do not live in fear, for God is with you and he's leading you. Amen. 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 Many blessings. Until we meet again in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.